Chapter 19 Staring out the barn window, I watched the overcast sky drifting overhead. It was peaceful, really. I kept a lookout for any rainbow specks, but there was no sign of her. Maybe she had today off? She probably handled the weather during the winter, too. I shifted myself in the hay, deciding that the loft was rather comfortable. My ears twitched and rotated around to face partially behind me as I heard the conveyor start up again. This is the third test now. So far, it had been working flawlessly, much to her enthusiastic delight. Even Big Mac seemed quietly impressed by it as his sister tried heavier and heavier loads. I didn't hear anything straining, so I took that to be a good sign. She was trying a full crate on it filled with apples this time around. Twilight sat a good half dozen meters away, ready to try operating the lid for La lift from the loft. Last night had been, well, awkward for all accounts. I'd ended up going home with Twilight again at her insistence. I was going to stay with Rarity instead, but the Lavender Unicorn looked one part horrified and another guilty at my suggestion, and had specifically requested another chance, whatever that had fully implied. Mares were so complicated. <coughs> Of course, once we get home, things were a little bit better for a while. She left me alone for the most part, and I just read up a more on Equestria's history. Although she did ask me a few strange questions about Fluttershy. How was I supposed to know if she was going to act, if she was acting overly strangely or not? It made me wonder what they had talked about yesterday for so long. No, the real awkwardness came when it was time to go to bed. It took a certain level of finesse to brush your teeth, when all you had was a hoof. They had almost everything imaginable with loop attachments for proper use without magic, of course, but it took practice to use them. This was a nightly event, however, so I was getting better at it. Twilight hummed as she wandered about the room outside of the bathroom. Several books were out still, and she had moved the wood samples upstairs, it had seemed. That meant the mess surrounding them had migrated alongside, and now she was busy putting books away, probably out of fear that I'd trip on them and break something. The spikes were quietly curled up in a loose ball in his little bed, residing at the foot of Twilight's much larger bed. I smiled over at him as I brushed. Tonight had been more pleasant than anticipated. I had expected to be grilled by Twilight upon returning, but she was overly pleasant instead. Idly, I wondered exactly what Reddy had said to her earlier. I said it wasn't anything I had done. Satisfied that every minute surface of my teeth was scrubbed down, I placed a toothbrush back in its spot and ran a little water into the sink to probably wash away the any remnants. Totally kept the bathroom immaculate, and I certainly wasn't going to be the one to break that trend. She gave me a warm smile upon my exit, sitting down oddly next to my makeshift bed. I hesitated slightly, wondering if I was yet to be questioned tonight after all. How are you feeling? She quietly inquired, smile not faltering. Well, that was while well, while a question that was hardly the one I had expected. Uh, I'm tired after today and a little sore still, but better. Or did you mean mentally? I returned, restraining all snarkiness from my voice and trying to keep a calm, stoic expression. Her ears lowered slightly alongside her brow, but she shook her head carefully. A moment later, after seemingly considering her words, she answered. No, I know you're not fully recovered from everything you've been through. That's to be expected, however. I am regret not taking your feelings into consideration over it. Rarity opened my eyes to that. What did she say to you exactly? I finally asked, voice softening as I walked over towards the end of my bed and sat down next to the corner a meter away from her. It was a lot of shouting, but I think you've guessed the most of it. She fed me my own words back about how important trust is. I kind of forgot that in my defense of my teacher, I admit. She explained, unable to meet my eyes any longer and looking down instead. I chuckled weakly. Yeah, I really had guessed as much. Still, it wasn't entirely as predicted. It's understandable. I mean, comparatively speaking, the amount of time spent with Celestia is an ocean to my bucket. It makes sense that she'd be a higher priority, I reasoned. 
that was a mistake, it would seem. Tide's ears dropped all the way down. I started to shiver as she looked back up at me again. No, Mender. I'm just not used to this. Please, I know trust is important. Can I have another chance? She requested, heading closer to me suddenly. Huh? Another chance? I didn't know what she was referring to in all honesty. Uh, what do you mean, another chance? I decided to just straight up ask instead of attempt to guess. A break from character for me, but there was way too many possibilities this time. To keep your trust in me. I know it's asking a lot of this one, but I really want you to trust me, to know that I'm not going to hurt you. Lover and Unicorn expanded upon. Her eyes locked onto mine solidly, and I couldn't look away for a moment. I wasn't so much talking about the physical pain, but the emotional when she didn't acknowledge my concerns and just passed it off as me being crazy. Still, she seemed extremely sincere, and I didn't want to mention that lest she be further hurt by the memory. Finally, I just decided on a nod. I earned a quiet exhale as she slumped sideways under my bed. Thank you, Mender. It's been bothering me all day, she muttered. I bit my tongue, not wanting to sound bitter or anything. You don't need to thank me, Twilight. Even if you're scary sometimes and don't often believe me, I still really, really like you. You've done a lot for me and are really kind. I can't imagine where I'd be if I weren't for your help so far. I redirected, ending up thanking her instead, technically. I almost chuckled at her flustered reaction and pink cheeks. Mender, I haven't done that much, plus I've been a terrible Philly friend, she groaned, sitting up fully again and brushing her bangs aside with her right forehoof. I snickered before reaching for her and straightening the side of her mane out for her. She watched me, expression softening before she smiled. Well, I'd like to make it up to you, regardless. I also promised you some more experimentation earlier if you're up for it. She suggested, surprising me running her left foot along the top of my bed while smirking. My brain did a flip inside of my skull, so it suddenly became my turn to blush. Wait, what? What brought this on? I asked, unable to keep the surprise out of my voice. She momentarily looked delighted in my reaction before shaking her head rapidly. A again, I want to make it up to you. I was also reading up on a few kissing techniques that I would like to test. Thoroughly. There was a long, awkward moment as I broke eye contact with her, face now beat red as I stared at her hoof on the bed. Oh, how I wanted to, I suddenly realized. Warm, fluttering sensations were filling my stomach as I considered it. Still, I suddenly didn't feel right about accepting the offer. Then it suddenly dawned on me. I don't think I'm comfortable with applying some part of the relationship as a reward or payment. It feels wrong, I guess? I tried to explain. I was paying her in forgiveness instead of bits. Her eyes widened significantly and I realized she hadn't anticipated a negative answer. She hesitated and then gasped further and covered her mouth with her free hoof. Oh! I hadn't even realized it could be taken like that! I'm sorry! I wasn't trying to buy your forgiveness as much as somebody trying to say that I was, that I was sorry! But you're right, of course. It should probably be split into two separate aspects. Maybe we can experiment tomorrow night instead, she offered. I contemplated the fact that I'd just technically ruined my chances at what I had really wanted, but decided a moment later that it was indeed for the best. I wanted to embrace her because she wanted me there, not because she felt guilty. I managed to smile and a nod, which seemed to relieve her further. Honestly, I'm surprised. I saw the look you gave the bed right after I suggested it, she added before I could say anything. There was a certain amused tone to her voice that I didn't feel like placing. I averted my eye, my gaze as rapidly as possible, causing the mare to giggle in amusement. It was a whimsical, adorable noise that I decided I really should hear more often. Ah, you caught me. Trust me, I just suggested exactly what I didn't want to do. I admitted, blushing again. Dang. 
The heat had just died down too. So I had a feeling she'd appreciate the honesty. Instead of being annoyed, she looked further amused instead, with a, just a hinting of relief. Well, I'm glad you're definitely interested in me. I've been doing a lot of reading on the subject to try to improve myself, but this is really different from anything I've studied up on before. There's not exactly a lot of concrete data, she complained, sighing wearily and glaring over at her personal bookshelf on the other wall. I tried not to laugh. <laughs> Maybe you should just ask me instead? I know that I've never done this before, but if we were testing compatibilities, it would make sense that the best source of likes and dislikes would be the other pony. I pointed out, smiling gently towards her. She seemed to consider it for a moment before smirking again and nodding. Interestingly enough, that's what most of the books said, too. I guess it really is a good idea, then, she agreed. I was suddenly glad the book supported me. Celestia forbid that the book suggests covering me in tar and feathers before lighting me on fire. Well, again, you can ask me anything you want. I'll try to answer to the best of my abilities, I promised before yawning tiredly. She stepped aside as I idly climbed up onto my bed before flopping over. Well, technically it was Applejack's bed, but that sounded wrong when I mentally said it. Remember what would kill me if I climbed into the farm mare's bed. Actually, there was a long list of points that would kill me should that happen. I was in the same room as one of them, too. Twilight oddly didn't move away and just gave me a curious, thoughtful gaze as I settled myself in. I was about to ask her what was wrong when she pointed out and said, You're technically my co-friend now. That gives you obvious privileges, you know. You don't truly really have to sleep there alone if you don't want to. Oh. Like I said, last night had been intensely awkward. Regardless, she definitely got the point across that she was willing to open up more to me. I tried to gauge my own opinion on the aspect, but in all honesty, I didn't know what to think about it. I know next to nothing about equestrian dating or relationships, so I didn't know what to expect or what was expected of me. It was a little frustrating. It's a sound success, Mender. It has no problem with three full apple crates. Twilight suddenly announced, sounding as if projecting it in my direction. I snapped out of it and smiled back at her, nodding. I'd have felt like a total idiot if, I'd, if it had broken on the trial run, of course. If there was anything I had my confidence in, it was my engineering capacity. Darn tootin' it worked. This is gonna be right nice come packaging time. For us, we don't need to recruit a ton of help, which is gonna save a lot of bits. I heard about like skin from under me somewhere. She sounded significantly pleased, so I took the job as completed to her satisfaction. The conveyor slowly came to a stop as large red sound ladder chart. Yup. I got to the edge of the loft in time to see him hop off the tread, not even looking winded. Damn. He just powered the conveyors for almost an hour and he wasn't even sweating. My ego plummeted as I realized just how out of shape I was. If I would or Twad noticed my crestfallen expression, they didn't say anything. The farmer stretched next to the side of the conveyor before giving a brisk nod as she examined it. <laughs> this is one nice piece of equipment. Willing to get this willing to get the gals out here again and see what they helped create, she observed, sounding happy indeed. I couldn't stay glum when she was so happy with the results and quietly smiled and said. I think Mender deserves some credit, too. Twilight spoke up, giving me a start as I suddenly realized she was right next to me sitting down. Applejack didn't even hesitate before looking up at us and nodding, still grinning from ear to ear. I reckon you're right, Twilight. If you give me a little bit, I can get his pay ready. I don't keep that much on hoof, you know? She offered shift into a simple smile instead. That, in turn, shifted to raised eyebrow and head shake as she saw my ears drop again. You can just give anything I earned after the rent for your cot to Twilight. I'm sure it isn't more than what room and board would be, I groaned, lowering my head again. It wasn't just awkwardness, but also a sense of shame from leeching off these wonderful ponies so much. Mender, you worked really hard for this. You deserve something in return, Twilight stubbornly protested, turning towards me more fully. Sighing, I shook my head before admitting, I just wanted to be useful. I wanted to help so maybe you and the others would think more highly of me. Or at least give me the benefit of the doubt, I suppose. I'd never had friends before and was rapidly realizing how much it hurt when I thought you were totally off your rocker. I bit her lower lip before gently pushing into me and wrapping her forearms around my shoulders. She was quiet, however, and didn't appear to know what to say. 
I know we got off on the wrong hoof, Mender. Knowing what I do now, I know why, of course. After all this, and your right, proper attitude all around, I do think of you highly. Abadak spoke up, wandering close to the edge of the loft and looking up at me fully now. I sighed, but nodded. Then keep your bits. Take all this as my honest apology for scaring you and acting so creepy when we first met. I want to be useful to you, Mares, and this is a good start for paying all the kindness. I explained openly. It had been bugging me since this, since she had insisted on paying me, and it was good to finally get it off my chest. The orange mare's ears flattened back, and she frowned, however. Her mouth opened to say something when a red furred hoof pressed down gently on her shoulder. Let it be, AJ. Big Max spoke simply, yet strongly. She glanced over at him, eyes darting back and forth in mild confusion before locking with his. A second passed before she gave a fresh clicking sound and shook her head, glancing back up at me. You're right stubborn, you stallions. But I suppose I can be too. Fine. You're a darn good guy, though, and I'm going to tell everyone all I can about your skills. I have a feeling you're going to earn quite a lot of bits with your talents. I accept a good meal for your time, though. Try some fight it, too. Abadak finally gave in, gesturing towards Twilight as she did so. Twilight groaned, raising her head off my shoulder and looked at her friend below. I'm not sure, Applejack. I might pop if I try another one of your home-cooked meals. Whoa. I suddenly got a mental image of Twilight swelled up like a balloon, barely able to move and tried not to snicker. The snicking would have would lead to me having to explain what was funny, Winter would probably get me a fast ticket down from the loft. Abadak rimmed up at her before nodding. I'm serious, though, on all accounts. Word of mouth is real strong around these parts. Your magic and skills are real convenient, you have to admit, she repeated, shifting her gaze back up to me instead. Um, I'm not sure of what use other poems would have for technical things, but I'll help her needed. I assured, trying my best to smile for the farm mare. She rolled her eyes, of course. I don't think you're going to be so lucky as to escape without pay again. That goes for any more work you do for me, too. I hope you know. She warned eyes, dancing in amusement. He's not going to escape getting rewarded regardless. Don't worry. Twilight assured, making me blatantly aware that she was still holding on to me. I blushed, but she just kissed my cheek and grinned, eyelids lowering a little. There's something about her expression that made my heartbeat suddenly pick up, and I swallowed. Wow, I reckon that's darn good incentive regardless. Get for rather than gossip on y'all, though. The country mare teased, tossing a wink to both of us. Twilight snickered and nodded before tipping us sideways off the loft. I ca it caught me totally by surprise, and I just started to inhale in shock when a magic gently caught us both and we drifted to the floor. Neither Apotech nor Big Mac so much as batted an eye at the display, which probably shouldn't have surprised me. Magic really was commonplace in Equestria, after all. You're welcome to help out on the farm as well, when you want. You mentioned wanting to get back and shave, and apple button will do you real good. I won't turn on one of them magic massages at the end of the day, either, she added uh, upon fully uh, of us sitting on the ground. Oh yeah, I want to get back into shape again. If it helped my magic improve, I was all for it. Todd just perked at the admission, though. Magic massage? What do you mean? She asked curiously. Oh boy! Your cold friend's right good with his hose. Adds magic to the touch, getting in real deep and twicking the muscle with heat and shaking. It feels like a slice of paradise. Apatrick revealed, closing her eyes and releasing a police clicking sound as she seemingly remembered what I'd used before. Pat rose an eyebrow and glanced over at me curiously. I swallowed and rapidly shook my head. Her shoulder was sore after working on the conveyor last night, so I just gave it a little rub. I assured, just in case she was suspecting me of anything. She laughed instead, however. <laughs> I trust you, Mender. Actually, I was thinking of asking for a sample when we go back to the library. She informed, smiling warmly instead. My heart skipped a beat and I felt heat grow in my chest when she said that. Maybe things really were taking a turn for the better. Darn tootin'. I know you wouldn't cheat on your mare. Or mares, as the case may be. Out I chipped in, voice dripping with mirth. I blushed and gave her a deadpan stare, causing her to burst into hearty laughter. I couldn't keep the stoic expression and snickered myself at a rather contagious display. I started to notice that all six friends had different mannerisms to almost everything they did. Twelve was more prone to quiet giggles and smirks, whereas Zapotec just openly and honestly laughed when she felt like it. 
Both are appealing in their own way, and I start to really appreciate all the differences between them. Well, men, well, men and I will probably stop by tomorrow before the trip. We'll be gone for a few days, so we have to say our goodbyes before leaving. For now, though, we need to go back home and pack. Twilight reminded gently, nodding back to her friend who finally composed herself. Big Mac stretched in the background before swapping out yoke hooks that hung on the side of the barn wall. There appeared to be a lot of variations of them, probably for different purposes. You have to pack, anyway. I don't own anything yet, remember? I added, giving her skeptical yet amused glance. Twilight rolled her eyes and gave me a light shove before smirking again. I'm still going to pack things for you. I figured the three of us will largely be hanging out together anyway once Freddy gets done with her show and socializing. Twilight reasoned, quickly catching me in her magic I tipped over from her shove, unable to rebalance myself upright. If and I don't take her on that anyway. You know how she likes to schmooze with the frou frou crowd? I would like warned, rolling her eyes yet retaining the smile. No pony batted an eye when I tipped over either, I noticed. I didn't even glance my way before catching me. Did that still mean that my blundering was more commonplace than magic? I let out a giggle before nodding and standing again. I'll try to keep her on a tight leash. You do take care, of course. We'll see you tomorrow before we leave, she assured yet again. I took my cue to stand up again, shakily making sure I remained balanced this time. Good. I'll hold you to your word, of course. Take it easy, then, and have fun with that reward later, y'all. Applejack returned, throwing a wink in at me as I blushed once again. Before I took it in stride this time and just smirked before hauling me back towards the barn door with a series of nudges. Oh, he, oh, we will. Don't worry. She tossed back as we left the barn. What had I gotten into? Reality continued to surprise me, however. I stretched gently as I watched Troy dance from shelf to shelf, peeking through each one's contents. I could she levitated an item or two down into the third bag we'd packed. Regardless, I simply sat there, watching her while holding the bag open with my forehoof. The room was dimly lit by now, the sun having sunk below the horizon about an hour ago. Eight o'clock, maybe? Todd had instead insisted on getting to work on the wood samples when we got back to the library rather than any prior of experimentation she had mentioned. This caused mixed feelings of both relief and disappointment in me, surprisingly. I guess I always got so anxious when she started acting like that. I started second-guessing my own actions. A pleasant aroma drifted into my nose from the kitchen as Twilight lightly hummed. Spike was making supper, I knew, and I had been relieved of my kitchen duty by him at the moment. But when I referred to relieved, I meant conscripted by Twilight instead. Apparently she can't hold the bag open and still focus intently on fretting over what to pack. Of course, I just got a stiff glare when I mentioned she might be overdoing the whole preparation thing. Not that it mattered. The scene was infinitely better in here. And I didn't have to be concerned about lopping off a hoof and adding it to the meal at any point. My eyes over Todd as she worked, earning warm butterflies in the rest of my body at each movement they caught. She was absolutely gorgeous and didn't even try to be. Maybe it was just my perspective, but I certainly didn't mind just watching her pack things. It might be a little biased, but at least I knew I wasn't the only one who would think that way. It was surprising to realize that Flesh, I definitely liked Twilight as well, but I saw her reasons easily enough. Not that it feels like these really needed a reason in the first place. Dominic Unicorn glanced back at me after dropping yet another item into the bag. Her gaze caught my own once more, and she immediately blushed, a light shade shift that was almost imperceptible in the dim light. She uttered a light groaning sound and looked away slightly. I know I said I don't mind you looking, but I think I'd actually find it easier if I caught you eyeing my flank instead or something, she muttered in a somewhat pointed fashion. I chuckled in amusement. Well, they're very nice flanks, I agree, but I like a whole lot more than just them, I reminded, sticking out my tongue afterwards. She smirked at my impish reply, and her expression relaxed a little. Your flattery only works because I know you're honest. Most would get a magical boot to their flanks after, if they said that, she warned, snicking a little at herself. I coughed a little, painfully aware of how popular she was not needing a reminder. 
Oh, I know. I'd be the first to wallop them. I agreed to giving a close check on the wicked green monster that was busy snarling inside of me. Tide's smile softened and she nodded, adding, A little possessiveness is good, I think, in a relationship, I feel. The books I've read on the matter warn not to let it go too far, but I don't think you're anywhere near that. This statement was accompanied by her shifting close and softly brushing her cheek against my own. The heat drifted into my face again and I looked down. It still surprised me that Twilight wa herself wanted that kind of attention from me. She could probably have any stallion she wanted to. Still, I was too close now to treat her as anything other than just Twilight. She'd been introduced to me. Not as to me, not as a national hero and student of the practical goddess ruler, but just as a skilled magic user and kind mayor. First impression stuck hard. She didn't appear to mind, however. I kind of feel badly that I have all this packing to do, but you don't have anything. She muttered, breaking me out of my contemplation a few moments later. I raised an eyebrow before the impish smirk returned. I'm telling you, you probably barely need half of this stuff. As predicted, she'd shot me a dirty look before visibly scoffing. I must be prepared no matter what. I might be called upon to do practically anything, so it helps to be ready. I might need to help organize or set up for the party, even. She reasoned, flailing her forelegs up and, as, as a, and about as if practically panicking already. I averted my eyes and coughed. Of course, I could probably feel her piercing glare bore a hole through my head. So, the telescope and Ori are to help with that? I inquired curiously, if not a little sardonic in tone. Those are for entertainment after the party, she defended sharply after a moment's hesitation. Didn't you say that about the mortar pest on Alembic too? I reminded, raising an eyebrow towards her incredulously. So I gave a fresh red pouting stare before I started laughing and she flailed at me. Oh, you! <laughs> You're so frustrating sometimes. Fine, I'll leave this telescope and aura here, but I actually cannot afford to leave behind my alchemical equipment, she insisted. I shield my face from her flurry of playful swat with a foreleg while continuing to snicker. All right, all right. Princess Twilight wins. Your loyal servant shall carry your alchemical supplies as long as well. I conceded in as theatrical a manner as I could muster. Of course, it was just a little poke, a little more playful fun at her. Try gave us me a curious wrist abra before a smile danced onto her expression. That's Princess Twilight Sparkle, thou must remember. We must be addressed properly. She insisted a moment later, playing along with it and shifting to a strangely familiar speaking mannerism. I tried not to laugh and continued along with, My apologies, my princess. Is there anything this humble servant can do to earn forgiveness? Pending any further transgressions, we have already forgiven thou. However, she, she continued, before her eyelids lowered a little and that grin returned. Uh-oh. I found myself on my back before I could say anything. Apparently one needs a certain threshold of air in one's lungs in order to properly formulate vocal noises. It was a fascinating discovery. Learned at the same time that was the fact for kissing one definitely did not require that same threshold. Till I broke contact a few seconds later. I'm still hovering over my light flesh on her cheeks still. If thou keeps being so adorable, Surely we can spare a pleasant reward, she followed up, assuming from her prior sentence. Okay, now she's just screwing with my head. I rolled my eyes while smiling, still before reminding, Surely, Princess Twilight Sparkle remembers that she shall be very busy with her duties all night and won't have time for such. Her eyes lit up with amusement as I continued. So I started to question just how much she was enjoying this verbal exchange. It didn't help that she was pressed right up against me, chest to chest. Focus, Mender! We shan't be busy all night, of course. Much rewarding shall be done upon retiring for the evening with thou. Time informed before slowly starting to inch closer. All alone. Together. I breathed and caught as I felt hers gently against my chin. She was teasing me again. Why did she like doing this so much? Or else I kept forcing myself to remember that. I started to playfully scoff and resume the acting of course regardless of how my blazing cheeks probably shifted me out of character. She interrupted, however, further, however, by ducking down and pressing a heated kiss directly to the side of my neck. My eyes flew open in shock at the same time my body locked up at the new, entirely unexpected sensation. 
It was like a light switch got turned on and I was suddenly all too aware of my intermingling fur between our bodies. She was so soft and warm that I couldn't help but lift my fur legs up and wrap them around her back, pulling her closer against me. Her kiss, pu her kiss pushed harder up my neck and she added a light lick before lifting her head up again, smiling down at me with a victorious grin. Ooh, someone has a sensitive neck? I'll have to remember that. She observed slightly, causing me to swallow. If I couldn't manage to say anything as I stared up at her in shock, cheeks feeling like they could fry eggs if given the chance. I can still hear you, you know! was suddenly shouted from the direction of the kitchen. Twilight's mischievous grin melted into an embarrassed, shocked look in less than a heartbeat. I coughed slightly, seemingly reminding her that I was still here and currently underneath of her. She gave a guilty smile and awkwardly stumbled sideways off me, trying to untangle her legs from mine. I fought down stirring feelings and managed to get onto my hose again, unable to, pu unable to push back the blush. Ah, uh, we should keep backing up, she finally excused awkwardly almost ten seconds later. That might not seem like a lot, but when blushing fiercely in a supposed active conversation, it's an eternity. Sighing, I nodded weakly and stood up fully again, feeling my back legs crack in a somewhat pleasant manner. We've almost got everything packed now. Can you get the drawings and notes I made about the wood samples as well? They're in the sample cabinet over there. She requested, gesturing with a hoof before peeking over the shelf in front of her, gathering up what happened to be official papers. Oh yeah, she'd wanted to present her findings to Princess Celestia the day after the party. She'd indeed working, been working hard on it, not that I thought whatever it was in the forest was still around at this point. I wandered over to a series of three wooden cabinets, all in a row. Sure, she sure kept a lot of samples. Pity she didn't specify which one the wood notes were in. I meant to have decided that she was also on a list of things I'd never thought I'd be looking for. Notes on blocks of wood. Mentally shrugging, I just decided to metaphorically bite the bullet and open the first cabinet closest to me. The moment of peace and tranquility before utter horses in just serves to make the effect worse. Maybe it was because I wasn't expecting to panic so suddenly, or maybe it was the mundane outer appearance of the cabinet that threw me into a false sense of security. Regardless. My eyes widened and almost popped free of my skull after I opened the first cabinet and came face to face with three hellish rocks straight out of my nightmares. My first distinct thought while stumbling backwards and falling away from the cabinet was wondering why she had kept them. After what they had almost done to both myself and two of her closest friends, the rational solution would have been to find a place that she could obliterate them. A lot of the floor, a tectonic shift came to mind almost immediately. So why were they here in an unassuming cabinet all of 30 feet from where I slept that night? Mender? Todd asked immediately upon hearing the crashing noise of me tripping over my own hooves and landing on my back. I rolled once and slid to my hooves again, carefully lowering myself against the direction of the rocks, ready to dodge in case any eldritch tentacles lashed out at me or something. There was no movement at all from them, however. I distinctly noticed that the shifting, distorting effect that had given me a headache when I looked at them the first time was also absent. Tight moved into my vision and rapidly closed the cabinet again, not meeting my gaze. She hastily opened the third cabinet instead and pulled out a stack of paper notes. That was it? She was just going to stash them and pretend I hadn't seen them? She knew exactly what I would seen in there. Twilight? I warned, eyes narrowing a little as I stared at her. She halted, sighing before putting the papers into the folder she was still holding. I know. I said I got rid of them, she admitted, lowering her head before looking back over at me in a guilty manner. It had been discussed prior after they'd officially caught up to me as to what happened after I lost consciousness. She told me they had deactivated after the explosion and she'd disposed of them. Why? I asked, relaxing a little bit. A part of me expected the cabinet to burst open again, pulling us all into the inky darkness no matter how much we screamed. She still refused to meet my gaze. They're important, Mender. If something like that happens again, having samples might be the only thing that stops disaster, she defended, distinctly interested in her right forehoof. I exhaled quietly, finally deciding that she had only half lied. They certainly didn't look the same as they had, so maybe they were truly deactivated. The cold sensation slipped into me again as I remembered the feeling of having one of their tendrils attached to my chest. It was so cold that it burned, creeping into my body as it tore through the tissue and wormed its way into my very being. 
The worst part was knowing what it actually was. A hole in reality going back through to the very place I so wanted to avoid. I doubted any living thing would survive the transfer via that method, however. Regardless, I finally gave up. Really, if it wasn't that big of a deal, I guess. If they were deactivated, they were only rocks. Sighing, I nodded to her and lowered my head. If there was something I could do anyway, I could hardly force her to get rid of them. This was her house, and they were technically her property after all. My ears twitched and I frowned, remembering that I technically didn't have any property in the first place. Mender, are you okay? I'm sorry that I didn't tell you the truth. I didn't think you'd understand me wanting to keep them. She apologized, hedging closer to me carefully. I held my ground and didn't shrink back this time as best I could. Surprisingly, she smiled and edged closer yet before gently pecking me on the forehead. Thank you, Mender. I'm not going to hurt you. She'd said it before, but I guess it was just a matter of convincing myself of it now. I know, Twilight. It just surprised me is all. I muttered slowly, looking Buck back up at her again, unsure of what exactly I was supposed to say. Thankfully, Spike saved me the awkwardness. Hey, you two! Dinner's ready! The old dragon called out from the kitchen and dining room area. Glad peeked past me towards the sound of his voice before nodding and smiling further. I took my cue and turned around, heading towards the glowing doorway that led to the fully lit kitchen. It was so much more peaceful at night, I decided. Hoofsteps slowly followed me, indicating my filly friend was coming along, too. I still felt weird to even think about it. Spike had produced a rather simplistic dinner, obviously made for three ponies. Well, two ponies and a drake. I didn't exactly know what to call him. Regardless, it was more than pleasant, even if it was the last one to f even if I was the last one to finish eating. It was a mistake to learn how to use utensil loops for my hoof, I decided. Twilight's magic and Spike's opposable thumbs easily beat my clumsy attempts at eating using at using just my hooves. So I even choked back a couple of giggle giggles after I poked myself in the muzzle with the fork for the second time. Who knew spaghetti could be so frustrating to eat? Eh. By the time I finished, Twad had migrated to finishing up the packing, and Spike was already washing the dishes. He was more than a little surprised when, instead of just dropping my plate in with the rest, I set it in and proceeded to help him clean everything that was left. He was an earnest, he was an earnest little guy, that much was for sure. I felt bad that he worked by himself all the time, though. It took us another ten minutes or so to finish drying the dishes, and I saw his eyes starting to slowly droop by the time he put the last one away. Admittedly, I had no idea where to put them once they were dried. Getting a little sleepy there, Spike? I asked in amusement, obviously already knowing the answer. He sighed and nodded before smiling warmly again. Yeah, it's almost bedtime. For thanks to you, I got that last short done 20 minutes early and can get some extra sleep tonight. He exclaimed, sounding as if he were a little kid in a candy factory. I snickered as he wobbled to, and tried to get off the counter. In order to reach the upper cabinets, he had to climb up and stand on the surface of the on the counter surface. Afraid he was going to fall, I walked up next to the counter, right where he was set to get down. He gave me a happy nod before stepping down onto my back instead and flopping forwards. He was still light as a feather, even after eating, so I proceeded out of the kitchen towards the stairs up to the loft. Twilight, who was sitting on the couch and sorting her bag, smiled up at me escorting the sleepy dragon and nodded in approval. I perked and gave a single nod back before slowly making my way up the stairs, careful to watch where each of my hoes are going. Now that would have been ironic, I was worried he'd hurt himself, so I came up the stairs only to trip and fall down at myself, both of us ending up in the hospital. Thankfully, I made it to say safely to the loft and deposited him near the bathroom door. Thanks, Mender. You're so, uh, totally awesome. Yeah, that's it. He thanked sleepily, seeming to struggle with his words. Don't worry about it, Spike. Just brush your teeth and enjoy your ex the extra sleep time. I waved off, smiling pleasantly at him. I was kind of glad he was taking Twilight and I so well, actually. Making myself useful around the house was one way to ease any transition time as well. Plus, he seemed seriously overworked, and I liked helping the little guy. He grinned and saluted me before turning and promptly running straight into the yet-closed door. I winced as the wood shook and he stumbled backwards like, Ow! Uh, oh, it's just a fluke. I'm fine. He happily informed before quickly reaching up and turning the doorknob this time. I fought back any snickering as he rapidly ducked inside and closed the door again without making eye contact. <laughs> Poor little guy. I decided to keep it my secret and head back downstairs. 
Try it sat at the la sat the last bag down on the floor at the base of the catch before looking back up at me, smiling again. She seemed definitely happy tonight, which was a good thing. After how awkward yesterday had been, I figured her transition to pleasant moods would have been a bit more of an involved process. Spike getting ready for bed, then? She inquired as I sat down on the other end of the couch from her, circling once on the cushion before flopping over onto my right flank. I stretched before her giving another brief nod, adding, Yeah. He's brushing his teeth, then turning in early. He did look really tired. He works really hard on all of his chores. I'm really thankful for such a dutiful and proper assistant. That's why he's number one, she explained, closing her eyes and giving a cute head nod as if to agree with herself. She really did seem to appreciate him, and plus she seemed more than happy with his position. Which that, I decided all was in indeed well. Still, I'm really glad you're helping him so much. I worry a lot that he tries to do too much by himself. She admitted a moment later, causing my chest to warm up a little bit. Yeah, she honestly did care about him. A lot. That made me feel a little better about things. He really is like a little brother to you, isn't he? I asked, smiling at her from across the middle cushion that severed at us. The urge to slide over and hug her was still there, but I didn't want to take a risk and destroy her good mood. Tight nodded pleasantly before looking back over the crackling fireplace instead. I've been with him since he hatched. He knows I'm not his mother, obviously, but I'm somewhere between his sister and surrogate mother instead. I'm glad you two have been getting along so well. You'll be able to spending a lot of time here, obviously, and I was a little nervous, she admitted, frowning. We thought fairly like on that topic, then. Well, things are working out, all right. Does that mean I shouldn't plan on getting my own place in the future? I questioned, smiling again. As predicted, that drew her attention back to me, wearing a frown. It disappeared when she saw my smirk, and she rolled her eyes, chuckling. <laughs> I won't let you leave even if you wanted to. Now to have the extra company going back to just the two of us, you would be really depressing, she informed, getting that impish grin again. I coughed and averted my eyes, earning a snicker. Platt rolled her eyes before adding, Oh, relax. I just don't want you to leave. We can obviously keep separate beds. I suggest getting an actual one soon, however. Applejack would probably want her caught back eventually. <laughs> don't remind me. I really do want to earn things for myself, don't worry. I assured, lowering my ears a little. She didn't falter and scooted over a little, resting her forehead and horn against my right shoulder. I know. You're a good stallion. Part of me was afraid of the relationship thing because I was worried about expectations and being controlled, not just because it's new and unfamiliar. I should have known better, of course. She revealed, pushing a little harder with her snout. Sighing, I rubbed a foreleg over her shoulder softly, needlessly assuring, You know I'd never do that. I just want you to be happy. Fully friend is just a convenient label. It doesn't come with any particular duties or requirements apart, apart from just being you. That much I didn't need to learn about dating. Sure, the terms are new, but my sense of integrity wasn't. She nodded against me gently before raising her head again and pecking my cheek. I know that now. I'm way more comfortable with this than I was before. It's just like being friends, only closer, she tried to explain, tracing her right for her right hoof in a simple triangle on my chest. Of course, most of you use circle patterns to their movements. Tide however, uses perfectly formed 180 degree triangles. A lot closer, I agreed before placing a kiss right above her horn. She made a murmur as her horn lit up to my touch, shuddering after I withdrew. Well, oh, that was an interesting reaction. Was her horn sensitive or something? I'd assumed it was just bone with a light layer of skin over it. She swallowed and shivered slightly. Hmm, easy there. I'm uh, actually a little tired tonight. I think we'd hold off on that reward thing until tomorrow night. She requested softly, opening her eyes to finally and looking up at me. I raised an eyebrow but shook my head, ignoring the sudden pang in my chest. Twilight, I'd figured you were just joking anyway. Of course we can just go to bed. I pointed out, unsure of why she was insisting on rewarding me to begin with. Her expression suddenly made me uncomfortable, and I couldn't help but look away. I saw her flatten back out of the corner of my eye. Of course I want to reward you for doing such an amazing job helping out my friends. It's kind of a reward for me, too. I'm just, well, tired tonight, she furthered, lowering her head a little. 
I nodded absently, eyes drifting carefully to the cabinet again. Come on, Mender. L let's go to bed. We have a long day tomorrow. We can enjoy each other's company tomorrow night when it's just us in my castle room. She minded, standing up and sliding off the couch. Mine drifted back to her before I gave her another nod and stood as well. Ultimately, I wasn't looking forward to the crowd and stuffy suit ready and no doubt finished by now. I'd be happy when tomorrow night was over, I had a feeling. Dawdling slightly as I went after Twilight, I gave the cabinet one last uneasy stare before scampering up the stairs.